and we'll be in. Good afternoon. Welcome to those joining us. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's session um, and discussions around cybersecurity. We will be kicking off uh, the event in just a couple of minutes. We'll just allow uh, some time for people to enter the space. So thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us uh, today for our discussions on uh, cybersecurity. Uh, we will be starting the formal part of the presentations in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll just allow people to enter the space before we start. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, my name is Lisa Desoy and I'm Head of Skills at the Mauritius Africa FinTech Hub. And I welcome you this afternoon for our discussions around securing FinTech's future and the opportunities and challenges in FinTech and cybersecurity. Um, just for those of you who may not be familiar with the Mauritius Africa FinTech Hub, um, our goal is to bring together all of the stakeholders in the fintech ecosystem uh, in order to promote the growth and development of the sector. Uh, our vision at MAF is to help develop uh, a pan-African fintech ecosystem through open collaboration between all the different stakeholding parties. And our programs uh, focus on building and supporting innovation, talent development, deal flow, and the development of a conducive regulatory environment that promotes growth for the sector for all. You can find out more about us um, at uh, www.mauritiusfintech.org uh, and stay tuned at the end of this show to learn more about some of the other things coming up. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, begin this afternoon's, uh, this afternoon's discussions by introducing our moderator for the day. Uh, Sheba Amugam. She is the Senior Lecturer at the Department of Information and Communications Technologies at the University of Mauritius. Um, welcome, Sheba, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everyone. I welcome you all to today's webinar on securing FinTech's future, opportunities and challenges in FinTech <coughs> and cybersecurity. This webinar is aimed to enlighten the current dynamics of fintech and cybersecurity, also to emphasize on how to protect yourself and your business from cyber threats, which is indeed a mental readiness for all of us for the mid 2021 and beyond. I'm Shiva Amugam, Senior Lecturer from the University of Mauritius at the Faculty of Information, Communication and Digital Technologies. My main area of research is in the field of network security, cybersecurity, and cyber forensics. For me, cybersecurity is fun and enjoyable due to the daily new adventure in the cyber world and the challenge of solving cybersecurity related issues. I'll be moderating today's webinar and I'm joined by the distinguished panel members Eddie Mix, FinTech Senior Lead at Aval Malak Technologies. Krishna Radha Kisun, partner at BDO IT Consulting Limited. William Dean Leung Pa Han, cybersecurity manager at Ernst & Young Limited. They're going to discuss exploration of how the pandemic has been a catalyst for FinTech opportunities and the cybersecurity challenges. I leave the floor for them to introduce themselves. Eddie, could you please introduce yourself for the view to the viewers? Thank you. Thank you, Sheba. Thank you for, for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, viewers. Um, just as an you know, introduction for me, obviously, I'm not, I'm not Mauritian. I'm, I'm an immigrant to Mauritius and enjoying my, enjoying my time here. I've, I'm a technologist at heart. I've been in IT for, for over 25 years. Um, 15 years spent in the software development um, environment for online gaming. Um, you might be familiar with uh, websites or, or sports books such as Betway. So that's what I was doing for uh, the last 15 years. And that's from application development 
through to payment systems, through to operations, through to data, data center hosting. Um, so primarily come across all the verticals that make up a, a, an IT technology space. So um, a wealth of knowledge in terms of, 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 of across those verticals. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Yeah, Krishna, can you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Krishna Walakisun, so partner at BDO IT Consulting. I head the cybersecurity service line at BDO IT Consulting. So um, I had a, a, a team of uh, ethical hackers, so they're good hackers, and uh, we cover Mauritius and, and the region as well, so uh, Eastern uh, Africa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Krishna. William, could you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm William Lem from uh, Anthony Young. I am a cybersecurity manager and uh, we worked uh, a lot in the African region and the Middle East. Okay. Thank you all for joining me today. So, just before moving further, before we take off, I just give the viewers a brief overview of cyber threat and to enlighten why cybersecurity is important. So as of now, most of the business, it has moved tremendously to the cyberspace. So since the COVID-19 pandemic, cyber criminals have found the cyberspace to launch more and severe attacks, eventually compromising the security of business, country, and individuals. It means cyber criminals are indirectly gifted with COVID-19 pandemic to benefit the cyberspace, to execute their crime while people are battling with physical coronavirus where they have left the security at stake in cyberspace. So these cyber criminals use this opportunity to exploit further. And during this pandemic, cyber attacks have escalated tremendously by the concept of uh, remote working or working from home dependability on digital devices and tremendous digitization usage. To mention few attacks, recently we came across WhatsApp hijacking, phishing emails on COVID, QR code scam, and there are many. So uh, currently we are actually facing two types of viruses, physical one, which is the coronavirus and the virtual one, the computer virus. One of the major concern for us is how to eradicate these two types of viruses. So cyber in general is a collective responsibility of everyone. As the world is increasingly interconnected, everyone shares the responsibility of securing the cyberspace. We can achieve this better secure cybersecurity with proper investment in security and consideration of this, and also emphasize on security awareness to the cyberspace users. So all cyberspace users should follow cyber hygiene by installing security software, updates the software on schedule, use of strong passwords and frequent password update, and many. So our interest, uh, industry leading panelists will discuss international trends on, in FinTech, including the rapid growth of e-commerce and online transactions, digitization, and remote working. We will also explore the ramifications of these from a security perspective, as well as discuss consumer awareness issues, including the recent major data breaches that have been in the news. All right, to take off, we start with the first question round. Actually, just before we get started, uh, um, I'm just going to say uh, this is we do welcome uh, participants' questions. Um, so please do submit your questions using the Q&A function, which you should be able to find uh, at the bottom of the screen. Here's a little guide just in case. Uh, so please do fire off your questions to our panelists. And uh, if your question is directed to any one particular person, any one particular panelist, please do indicate their name in the question. Thank you very much. And sorry. Thank you, Lisa. My first question goes to Eddie. Okay, Eddie, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, what trends do you see taking place in the FinTech space, particularly in Mauritius and the Pan-African region? Eddie, the floor is yours. Can you walk us through the FinTech space? Um, th yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Shiba. Um, you know, I think, I think from, you know, what is, what is in the, in the, in, the, in the view, 
in terms of fintech, I think there's so many that we can talk about. Um, there's so many interesting topics and so many new innovation coming out. And a lot of that has got to do with COVID and the catalyst of COVID and, and, and how we've had to react and change, uh, change our mindset primarily. Because, you know, the mindset way in terms of fintech has, has been there, but I think it's just been accelerated now by, by, by COVID. And we've, we don't have a choice. We need to accelerate um, as far as, as, as digitizing our lives, so to speak. Um, but, you know, for, for the topic, I'll, I'll focus on a few. And I, and, and I think the first one would be we need to, you know, our, our mindset in terms of how we approach dig, digitization needs to change. Um, and we've seen that change with the advent of, of, of COVID. Um, I think March last year, um, most companies weren't really geared, and I, and I talk about the, 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 the Mauritius context of working, from, working remotely or working from home. I think a lot of companies weren't really prepared and what, the, what that meant, specifically from a security perspective. Um, all of a sudden, we, we saw a huge uptake in MS Teams, I think MS Teams went from around 30, 32 million users a day to 75 million users a day just overnight. We saw how the growth of Zoom um, grew by 148% just in their share price. So it was obvious that um, everybody was moving and they had to move to, to, to sustain their business from a, from a work from home perspective. Um, at the moment, the stats from Ernest & Young are around 30% that, that employees are working remotely. Um, and that is growing. Um, so I think, I think that's the first, the, the, fir the first concept or the first trajectory from, from, from the pandemic is that we are now moving to a, a remote working situation. And some companies have been doing this for some time. If you look at GitHub, they've never had an office. Um, they have over 500 employees. They have been working remotely since their existence. They're very successful. So we know that it works. And every, any company that wants to review their journey from a remote working perspective should go and read the GitHub um, case study. It's very interesting. They've published all their, 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 their reviews and their understanding and how they adopted it and how they made it successful. So, you know, the remote working, I think, is yet to stay. Um, we're seeing that in, even in the job space where there's a lot of employees, uh, employers asking people if they can work remotely, um, especially in the software development stage. So I think I think this has been very, very, very interesting and, and, and companies need to adapt to that. Um, if we look at the, the second, the second thing for me uh, from a FinTech perspective is not so much, okay, what are we gonna do in FinTech? It's more the, the adoption of FinTech and the, the adoption of the FinTech mindset. Um, we've already seen how, how environments and are changing their, their digital posture, especially in Mauritius. We saw that as soon as COVID, we went to lockdown and uh, um, automatically um, companies were disconnected from their, their client base. They couldn't, they couldn't, um, they had no way of communicating with their, with their client base. Um, so they weren't prepared for the e-commerce uh, world. And we saw all of a sudden a, a bunch of new entrants come into the market that were offering services such as groceries, uh, butchery services, bakery services, um, consumer goods, just so that people could get what they needed um, without leaving their home, because that, that's obviously a risk. Um, so digitizing the workspace is, is, is something that also accelerated quite significantly. Um, you know, if we just look at uh, how Mauritius transact, transacts on a very traditional basis uh, needs to go to the ATM. They need to uh, withdraw their, their salary or, or their funds from an ATM and then take those funds and they go to go to the consumer source. So we're not seeing a very, you know, pre-COVID, you know, there wasn't a bit Mauritius from a, you know, transacting electronically. Um, and we're seeing how environments, is, I'm getting a message saying my internet connection unstable. Can you hear me, Shiva? Uh, it's, it's breaking a bit, Eddie. Your, your voice is breaking a bit. Okay, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah, it's a bit okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can carry um, on. So, so I think perspective, okay, good. Um, from an e-commerce perspective in a Mauritius context, we definitely saw an accelerated um, uh, journey from, from, from more traditional uh, brick and mortar, 
go physically to a more of an online. This has been this has been good for Mauritius. I think uh, Mauritius needs to adopt more of of the of the digital transactional space. See that grow in the new. We're seeing payment methods coming. We're seeing payment experiences. Banks are are, are starting to. Okay. I think I think these, these services. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a small disturbance uh, factor in your um, audio. Okay, let me let me. Is that better? Uh, can you just speak on a bit? Okay. You know, I think. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's better now. Is it better now? I think we start struggling with uh, with the internet. Um, so from, from that perspective, the, the, you know, if we look at the growth worldwide in, 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 in the last few years, you know, we've seen a 64% adoption worldwide, uh, mainly coming from Europe and from, from United States and, and China. In, in, in Mauritius context, it's been very slow. So in terms of behind the, behind the curve, in terms of adopting FinTech experiences, but we are starting to see, and we will start continue to see um, Banks, retailers offer a digital experience. We're seeing that growth in Mauritius at the moment. Um, something else that uh, you know, the next bank, I think I think data is on everybody's mind, and off, off, artificial intelligence is not just something we speak about. It's actually being adopted, and it's actually being implemented. You know, companies today um, sit on 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 huge amount of of insights and data. The problem is that they've got so many legacy type type applications that are either on premise or either in private cloud or, or public cloud. So that what, they, what they're struggling with is how do we get all this data into, into an environment that we can then access that data and start to stream that data and start to mine that data to give the insights on a daily basis. So I think we'll see a lot more of companies um, looking for that data, especially now that they've been disconnected from their, from their customer from a physical perspective um, due to COVID. And now they have to actually have it start having an electronic experience with those customers with the, the, the requirements um, coming from that information that, they, that they're mining. Um, we're seeing applications like uh, Power BI starting to be sorry, you know, scaling up in terms of the adoption. Companies are more interested with that data and what they do with that data. How do they understand their consumers from a retail perspective? What is my consumer doing? What are they buying? What do I need to change? So, you know, uh, we're finding that that fast paced movement from digitization is be you know, we're becoming closer to the customer in terms of their needs and how they react on a daily basis. And this information enables companies to react in terms of what Eddie? But how they present themselves at data space. Sorry. You yeah, yeah, no, still uh, breaking up? In between. That's okay. Now it's okay. Okay. Um, so, and then, you know, then bolt on artificial intelligence. And that's when those insights actually start to be learned. And we can start to, with artificial intelligence, start to pull this automatically. I think there's a problem with his. Uh... Eddie, I think I think there's a problem. With your, yeah, there's a problem with your uh, sound. Uh, it's it's getting breaking. Yeah. Uh, she was okay. How's that? Is it better now? There's nothing really I can yeah. do. Yeah, it's good. Is it good now? Um, yeah. So the artificial intelligence really takes around all the human intervention, human bias, and starts to learn those consumer uh, requirements and feeds those to the company that can actually to, to, to respond um, through, through those insights. So I think big data will definitely play a big role in, in, in our world um, in, time, in time to come um, as, as companies grapple with their own data, how do they, and obviously, you know, uh, um, William and Krishna will speak about the security components of how our data is secured uh, from a cyber security because that's obviously the RP and we need to start thinking about how do we how do we um, protect those assets or those, those insights so so I'm sure they will they will touch on those I think the other the next big one is it's it's, 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 it's a bit of a controversial one because it, it relates to, to to cryptocurrencies and digital currencies and blockchain I think this will probably be 
um, the web 3.0 people are talking about. But, you know, if we just see the acceleration um, this year, which has been fueled primarily with the Bitcoin interest, obviously with the Bitcoin price, but I think digital currency and blockchain has been around for a number of years. But I think, you know, companies are, are, and institutions and organizations are actually starting to see the value and starting to see where the problem is solved as far as a trust perspective, because that's what blockchain actually makes. You know, if we put it in a very simple terms, what does blockchain do? Well, it, it solves the trust issue um, purely because the data is immutable. It's on a distributable uh, public ledger, ledger. It's consensus management in terms of its decision-making process. So, you know, it, fit, it ticks all the boxes from a trust perspective. So I think blockchain solutions, and we've seen them already, uh, we're seeing uh, digital currencies coming to play. We saw China, um, you know, talking about how they want to digitize the yen. So there's a lot of communication. We're seeing uh, uh, cryptocurrency ATMs, um, roughly at about 40 new ATMs every day. We've seen v uh, Venmo and PayPal adopting uh, Bitcoin as a payment method. So and we saw tes Tesla investing in, in, in Bitcoin, as well as uh, you can buy a Tesla with Bitcoin. So they're accepting Bitcoin as a currency. So I think blockchain technology in terms of its user case, um, there's so many different user cases from, from FinTech down to agriculture, down to fishery, to, um, to supply chain management. There's so many use cases that, that can be solved there. Um, so I think from that perspective, um, those are the four things I would probably touch on in terms of what do we see accelerated growth, what's what's to watch out for, uh, what's the most interesting at the moment in terms of, of, of how these this technology can enable in business and, and, and help business to grow. I think from a Mauritius context, um, we're still in the very early stages of, of, of all of them, to, to be honest, um, but they are growing. We're seeing a huge amount of um, of, of, of capability coming into the space, particularly in open banking from a banking perspective. And that again goes to currency. We're gonna see more of um, open banking type environments where that information is shared with third party applications. Agency banking will definitely become a thing even though, you know, even though it's not, not readily available in, in Mauritius at the moment from a Mauritian context, but the globally um, agency banking is quite a big thing in terms of you know having agents as, as banks as well and providing those services bringing services closer to the cons to the consumer um so i think that for me would those four those four items would, would touch on you know what will we see in the fintech space in the near future um obviously the cyber security goes hand in hand with fintech it needs to be secure we need to protect data we need to protect users we need to protect okay. applications. We need to protect who accesses. And this is where cybersecurity comes into place. I've heard some horror stories of where companies, you know, during the, the, the uh, you know, go work from home and basically just giving them a laptop and saying, you know, just, just plug it in and, and, and start accessing environments. You know, we're talking about single sign-on. We're talking about cloud brokers as far as, you know, when you've got different applications where cloud has to talk to cloud, um, how do we do that? How do we do uh, implement uh, multi-factor authentication so we can verify that it's your device that's accessing particular um, applications, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this will become um, very, very, very topical in most businesses in terms of how they grapple about digitization, digitization, digitization themselves and, and how they also secure themselves at the same time. Um, so, Because I think for companies, this is quite a daunting, daunting topic. Okay, thank you, Ed. Thank you for walking us through the FinTech space and highlighting um, the, the trends during the pandemic time. That was indeed a great knowledge for, for us. My next question goes to William. William, building on what Eddie has mentioned, what are the impacts of these trends from a cybersecurity perspective? Can you share any statistics or data with our audience? William, the Shiba. floor is first. Thank you very much. So uh, from, from our perspective, uh, what we noticed since the start of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we are seeing companies uh, in the world and even in Mauritius, where they are trying to work out a, a hybrid model of working uh, on-site and off-site. So for example, as at EY right now, we are totally off-site right now until, uh, until the situation 
uh, gets better. And um, what we've seen, what we've also seen uh, across Mauritius and the region is that uh, to support this trend of working offsite, uh, companies are adopting technologies uh, faster and faster. So everyone knows the typical VPN technology, cloud technology and others. So uh, in terms of the cloud technology, uh, there are many people that, uh, uh, that uh, are Im implementing the infrastructure as a service, a platform as a service, or even software as a service. So uh, th those are the things where uh, we're going across, uh, in, across the region and even in the Middle East. Uh, unfortunate statistics, um, uh, Shiba, is that uh, during COVID-19, uh, we can consider it as one of the largest cybersecurity threats in 2020, just based on the number of scams and uh, malwares it has generated. So just to give you an idea, uh, worldwide, there, there was about a 400% increase in the number of scams. And uh, just the statistics released by Google itself, 18 million COVID-19 related malware were blocked uh, on the, from the search engines. So this is something that we have uh, in the cybersecurity field that we always have to take into consideration. Uh, another, another thing that was surprising uh, was a, a survey conducted last year where half of the respondents, so keep in mind that it's half who were honest, admitted that they're less likely to follow security policies when working from home. So, so out of all of the respondents, half uh, actually admitted this. So we can only imagine what, uh, uh, what the other people who didn't actually uh, 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 share their honesty on their survey is. So uh, this is the thing that, that we need to take care of uh, as cybersecurity progresses during uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, from our perspective in the region and uh, uh, locally, we've conducted uh, quite a few work from home assessments over the past year. And uh, companies, as Eddie mentioned, uh, there have been horror stories we've heard, uh, uh, we've heard and actually seen where companies have had to adapt to remote working uh, quickly. So some people uh, brought in workstations, they just open all of the ports. Uh, in terms of uh, technologies, as you mentioned, Teams, Zoom and others were being implemented faster. So uh, this is a thing that uh, we've seen uh, in the pandemic where companies have to be agile and uh, they've had to put more pressure on the IT administrators to make sure that uh, business operates smoothly. And uh, unfortunately, again, the, some of the things we've uh, noticed is that this leads to uh, shortcuts. So sometimes IT administrators would give users um, admin access on the workstations. So they can install software, they can install things just to make sure that day-to-day uh, uh, -day software works. And um, one of the things that we had to keep in mind in terms of stats is uh, a security a cyber security organization noted that uh, over the past years uh, over the past five years 83 percent of the critical vulnerabilities on microsoft products would not have been exploitable if administrator privileges were restricted or removed so lots and lots of uh, uh, exploits uh, is based on the uh, administrative privileges Another thing that uh, we've seen is that uh, since people are working from home, uh, attackers, they're also changing their way of uh, um, conducting DOS attacks. So DDoS attacks, the main purpose is to prevent uh, legitimate people from accessing the services. And uh, what we've seen is that uh, before, attackers used to focus on short-term disruption. So maybe the, the website is down for one or two days, uh, even a few hours, and then they're satisfied, they move on to the next target. So what we've seen is that uh, attackers are now focusing on uh, long-term uh, attacks. So maybe they'll, they'll consume only 60% of your bandwidth. Uh, it is sufficient enough to uh, not cause uh, an alarm on your security monitoring tools, but it is sufficient to start uh, uh, re uh, reducing the facilities of your employees. So these are the few things that we've seen uh, across the world and uh, even locally in Mauritius with some, some of the companies we've worked with. And, um, Hopefully it gets better uh, as technology progresses and uh, uh, let's see how it goes. Okay. Thank you, William. Um, just to add on to what William has uh, said, uh, and I also feel that uh, uh, what he said about remote working, uh, working at home, 
I feel bringing uh, company data to our home and mixing with the home data, I think there are more risk in that. And uh, if the, the home data, home, home device is compromised, this can compromise as well the company data. So the, it, it's a big risk actually. Thank you, William, for sharing your views on the impact addressed by AD. Uh, I move on to the, my, my next question is for uh, Krishna. Yes, Krishna, how should companies and in particularly fintech companies be responding to these cybersecurity threats? Krishna, floor is yours. Thanks, Shriba. Um, it is a common misconception that cybersecurity is all about IT. Um, obviously, IT plays an important role in cybersecurity, but on its own, it's not enough. I think um, there's increasing people that are working remotely, as you said. There's an increasing risk regarding that. Uh, you may have the best technology in the world, but if you don't have the proper processes and your staff is not well trained how to use those technology, you're still exposed to cybersecurity threats. So cybersecurity should consist of technologies, processes, and measures that are designed to protect individuals and organizations from cybercrime. An effective and robust cybersecurity uh, strategy to reduce uh, the impact of cyber attack uh, would require three dimensions. So that the people aspect, the processes aspect, and the technology aspect. I mean, it's, it's a fact that more than 95% of cybersecurity breaches are due to human error. So the most important part is the people aspect. Um, everyone in IT needs to be aware of their role in preventing and re reducing cyber threats. Whether it is how to spot a phishing email, handle sensitive data, how to use bring your own devices, and of course nowadays, how to work from home securely. Um, as you said, uh, William, uh, previously, I think many people that, that that are, are in the office and when they move to, to home, they get more relaxed and the way they, they, they behave is very different. Uh, we've also seen that people that would, would uh, not use uh, their laptops for personal use, uh, now because they're working from home, they're more likely to do that. So then start using Netflix, online shopping and downloading all sorts of uh, other things on, on their laptops or other devices. So it, this would also increase the, the, the risk. So it is very important that we ha you have a, an effective cybersecurity awareness program to, to help uh, preventing, exploiting your people actually. Uh, with the people being the weakest link, uh, cybersecurity is more of a business issue and everyone has a role to play uh, from the users to, this, to the top management. Uh, it's very important to, 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 for them to be aware and for them to, to ensure that everyone is well trained in, in that domain. And the next point is to do with the process. So processes are, are key uh, to the implementation of an effective cybersecurity strategy. These processes should include defined IT policies and procedures. So it should be clear who does what, when and how. Um, if people don't know what they need to do and how they do it, the, it always breaks down in the end. So that would include doing patch management, all the controls that you would expect that would already be defined and the different people would actually uh, do them. Um, and those processes, I mean, those processes are nothing if people do not follow them correctly. So it's very important to have regular IT audits to ensure that those processes with their controls are being well-defined and are being well, well uh, followed. With uh, increasing people working from, from home due to COVID, uh, it is also important to remind uh, employees about your organization's work from home security uh, policy and ensure that they actually follow it to, to the letter. From a technology point of view, of course, technology is obviously crucial when it comes to cybersecurity. But by identifying the cybersecurity risk that your organization faces, you can then start to look at what controls to put in place and what technologies you really need uh, to do this. Um, technology can be deployed to prevent or reduce the impact of cybersecurity security, security risk, depending on, the, on your risk assessment. 
and uh, the what you decide to be your acceptable level of risk. You, you're not going to go out there and start buying all sorts of technologies. You have to do a proper risk assessment and then decide, okay, based on that, what, what is my, my different stack that I want to have to protect uh, my data? Um, on top of your traditional technologies such as uh, antivirus and firewall, it is also increasingly important to protect your email system with solutions such as Minecast, because email still remains a major entry point for hackers in terms of social engineering by doing spear phishing or phishing. Uh, it's still the, the major entry point. Um, and, and also when we talk about cybersecurity, it's, it's not a matter of if you will be hacked, but more of when you be hacked. And when you be hacked, we do know that you've been hacked. So then it, it's worth investing in cyber defense solutions, such as dark trace, that can help detect cyber attacks and provide autonomous responses with its AI engine. Um, now with more people working from, from home, uh, it's very important to, to use a, a VPN because the VPN, the, so the virtual private network, it will encrypt the data and trans in transfer, allowing personal and confidential data to tunnel from one device to the next uh, away from the prying, prying eyes. And also many people have been, have been using uh, cloud platforms such as Office 365. It's key, if there's one thing that you need to do with Office 365 is to, to put in place multi-factor. It's so easy to fish people and get their, their, their uh, passwords. I mean, we run a number of, of phishing campaigns and every time we get between 10 to 20% of people that actually put in their, their username and password. Uh, and you only need one to be able to get in and then escalate within, within that environment. Um, I, I really like the, the ISO 27001 framework. Um, I mean, it's an international standard. Uh, on information security management system. Uh, what it does, it actually looks at the three pillars properly. So the people, the process and the technology. And, and it actually ensures that all, all those three are, are covered. Um, what we've seen in, in, uh, in Mauritius that a lot of, of the private sector have, have actually gone for that framework, which is very good. But, but abroad, uh, such as countries like Kenya, uh, it's interesting to note that the government as well, a lot in the public sector, are actually implementing um, such framework. Um, one, one last thing that I, that I would add is, while COVID-19 is a, is, a, is a big challenge for everyone, and if it's the last thing that you want to, to look at is cybersecurity, um, I think it do, does deserve a bit more attention. I think, uh, especially in the, the executive committee meetings, I think uh, cybersecurity deserves an, deserves an extra attention uh, because the risk has increased. Uh, the, the concept of the perimeter security has gone. Uh, everyone is everywhere. It's work from every, anywhere nowadays. So uh, it, it's very important that you reassess and, and, and check whether your, your users, your systems and data are, are safe. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, I do agree with you about uh, the cybersecurity priority right now, because I think the cybersecurity should be given more priority, especially during the pandemic time, because it has escalated a lot, the cybercrime during this time. So I agree with you. Yes, it, it, it's a good enlightenment on the response on cybersecurity threats on fintech companies and others. Thank you. So we move on to the second question round. My next question is for William. The, a number of high level leaks have recently been in the news, including those that expose to personal data from hundreds of thousands of Mauritians what are the ramifications of these kinds of leaks and what should consumer be aware of? William? Yes, thank you, Shiva. So uh, those, those leaks, those high profile leaks, so everyone has heard about uh, Facebook. Um, a few years back, there was uh, uh, the LinkedIn, there was Collection One, uh, those sorts of, uh, those sorts of uh, uh, we call it credential dumps. So what, uh, what the motion uh, user, those of you who uh, are concerned whether your credentials have been leaked or not, you can use publicly available websites such as um, Have I Been Pawned or others to check whether your account has been compromised. 
Um, the way it works is that it just you just simply put your email address, and then it would it wouldn't even uh, uh, ask you for a password or an account. It will just check in its own database to see uh, whether your email appears in other databases and uh, uh, why uh, whether it's um, on which website it was actually compromised. Uh, the reason why hackers uh, typically post this information for free or even sometimes they sell those information uh, is because uh, sometimes they just want to show that uh, um, they want to show that uh, they were able to do something. So not all hackers uh, are what we call the black hat and the white hats. There are some gray ones where they just want to post stuff to check things out. Uh, dump it and see how it is. So that that would be one of the things that uh, I would recommend uh, for those of you who are concerned whether you were compromised. Uh, another thing uh, we have to keep in mind, as uh, Krishna mentioned, uh, multi-factor authentication on any social media accounts or even corporate accounts is very important. So a study done by Microsoft itself uh, uh, identified that most attacks uh, that uh, that rely on uh, credentials uh, would have been uh, uh, would have been uh, uh, mitigated if multi-factor have been have been actually implemented. So, uh, so really, that's something that uh, has gained more and more prominence uh, over the years. Whether it is through the authenticator apps uh, or tokens that we've seen on our phones, or the one-time passwords that we receive through SMS or uh, email. Those type of, uh, those type of multi-factor authentication is really important. Uh, my next point is uh, some of you may be ask, uh, asking, why, uh, why would hackers be interested in merchant emails and data? So just to give you an idea, um, uh, over the past uh, year, uh, there is a yearly study uh, that identified that uh, the average cost of a single record, so a record can be someone's email, email address, credentials, ad uh, physical address as well, uh, cost $146 per record. So uh, of course, and that um, um, this value is slightly less for uh, for the uh, more, uh, African countries. So even if we uh, divide this into two, uh, which makes it about $73 per record, uh, uh, at the scale of the Facebook clique, where there's hundreds of thousands of merchants, uh, assuming only 100,000 merchants uh, were compromised, that's already $7 million for the hacker. So uh, that's something that uh, we really have to start realizing that any sort of information uh, hackers would, would be able to target. Uh, the study also identified that um, hackers typically aim for customer data. So that's something that we all in the business uh, sector uh, would uh, uh, prioritize in protecting, especially if, with laws such as uh, GDPR, such, such as the Merchant Data Privacy Act that was rolled out a few years ago. So all this is really important that we take into uh, consideration. And uh, a few a few questions we have to ask ourselves is, uh, yes, we have all those acts, the Merchant Data Privacy Act, the GDPR Act. So what happens now to Facebook? How, will, how do we take this forward from a merchant perspective? Uh, do we just rely on uh, the European Union to uh, to take it up with Facebook, or do we have uh, our own mechanisms? Uh, my third point also uh, comes into password uh, policies. So, on top of multi-factor authentication, typically uh, uh, people would believe in uh, password complexity uh, uh, with all the special characters. But uh, you'd be surprised that uh, last year, NIST, actually, uh, a few years back actually, NIST uh, started uh, recommending that uh, password complexity, if uh, coupled with multi-factor authentication, is not as important anymore. Uh, because uh, if you go with the concept that your password will be compromised, as Krishna mentioned, uh, it's a question of when rather than if, uh, it actually makes it harder for them the longer the password is to actually decrypt it. So that's, that's the position that NIST has started to um, position themselves across. Um, my final point is, um, is specifically towards the Mauritian market where um, 
I'm sure Eddie and uh, Krishna will agree, where in terms of uh, cyber, cyber security guidelines in the banking sector, we have uh, the Bank of Mauritius have lots of guidelines, uh, internet banking guidelines, ATM pen testing and others. But um, when, we can't, when we start looking outside of these sectors, such as healthcare and insurance sector, where there's also lots of personal information, there is a, a lot less guidelines. It becomes a lot less, it becomes more uh, who wants to be top of the class rather than uh, uh, a regulator imposing those cybersecurity guidelines. So that is definitely something that uh, I believe uh, we should start looking towards in the future. Thank you, William, uh, for highlighting the implications of the recent threats to the exposure of personal data and on the consumer awareness. Thank you. I move on to my next question to Krishna. The weak points of a company's cybersecurity strategy are often outside of the company itself. Can you elaborate on this and uh, offer advice to companies regarding mitigating these risks? Krishna, the floor is yours. Yep. Thank you. As previously mentioned, I think there's a lot of focus on looking at your internal people, um, internal processes, and your internal technology. Um, but we should also be aware that we are working with a number of uh, stakeholders. So whether it be your customers, your suppliers, or your vendors, this is in your ecosystem as well. Um, we, we found that, um, especially in the offshore sector, a lot of the attacks that have been happening is to do with the, maybe that the clients that have been hacked. And they are, they are, their accounts have been hacked and they are sending the instruction to the management company who is then using the internet banking to do the, the, the transaction. So who is at fault there? So it, it becomes hard to, 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 uh, to, to assess. So um, ultimately, the all stakeholders should be, should be trained. And we've been called upon by banks actually to come and train their, their business customers because you have to, to, to extend that awareness to your to your uh, ecosystem, which includes your clients, your vendors, and and suppliers. Your your suppliers, specifically, uh, depending on what they do, um, it's very important that they are aware of your information security policy. And the information security shouldn't just be a document that stays in your in your in your drawer. But it's something that you actually apply when you're getting a a vendor, a supplier. It's it's very important that that you do proper due diligence and see uh, to what level they are at. Um, there are some um, platforms that actually assess organizations um, from the outside. So you've got a security scorecard. So it places a, a level of security on that, on, on, on that organization. So it gives you an idea to what level they, 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 they operate at in terms of security. Um, and when you are outsourcing anything, uh, do make sure that you've got an SLA with, with a right to audit. You might not have to audit it yourself, but at least they would should be able to share what IT audits or IT security audits have been done on their environment. Because you, you're not, you, you might not, you might be securing, securing everything internal, but there might be some elements that's been done by those vendors and, and, and suppliers. And the, the, the other aspect I want to, to, to talk about also is um, with COVID, a lot of people are moving to the cloud. So they're using third-party services and, and there's a trend to, to the cloud. So we should ensure that all these platforms are, are secured as well uh, and, and aware of that ecosystem. I mean, th there was a recent breach uh, where the people managed to get in through Slack, which is a collaboration tool. Um, so you might be securing everything in terms of database, but your team is sharing everything through a collaboration tool called Slack. And they targeted the people via Slack. And through Slack, they got in. So it's very important to, to, to have a good sense of all the different tools that are outsourced uh, or cloud platforms that you're using and make sure that all these are, are secured as well. Um, one, one way we, we tend to look at, at um, uh, the, the security from a different perspective. So if you take ISO, uh, ISO would be people, process, and technology. You take, you can, Take NIST will be identify, detect, protect, and recover, etc. So that that's the that's the framework. But there's another another framework which which is Crown Jewels assessment, which is quite interesting. 
because it actually takes your data and systems from, from throughout its life cycle. So the data from the point that you create it, you share it, you transmit it, you store it and you destroy it. You follow that data and see what controls and what is involved. And sometimes you realize, oh, this data is being given to the, the, the develop, developers and the developers, or they have got the right controls or maybe not, or they're not using the, the extent. The production environment is okay. But when, when it goes to the, to the development environment, you see there are, there are issues. So it's very interesting to, to use that, uh, that methodology called uh, the crown jewels uh, assessment. So, and then you, you get to, to identify that sometimes you are sourcing uh, development. And this is an important point to, to take care of. So um, just to summarize, I mean, there's a lot of focus on we look at inside, but we should make sure that we are looking at all the stakeholders that are outside the organization uh, as well. Thank you, Krishna. Um, that was indeed a great knowledge for us. Um, I think even for the viewers. So my next question is for uh, Eddie. Uh, fintech and cybersecurity are aspects of wider digital transformation taking place within companies. In this, where is Mauritius on this journey and what do you envisage moving forward? Eddie, the floor is yours. E Eddie, you're muted. Eddie, you're muted. Yeah, I think you muted me, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think you mentioned me earlier, sorry, Shiba. Um, yeah, I think from, from a Mauritius perspective, we are definitely seeing a, a more open banking scenario. We're seeing a lot of banks inquiring a lot more around um, how, we, how we can open the banking environment to, to, to solutions that require this data to offer financial services to consumers, because that's really is what it's about. You know, there's, I don't know what the complete stats are in terms of the unbanked, but we know that there's 1.7 billion people that are unbanked. So this means that there's so many people that haven't got access to, and these are probably more in the, in, in the poorer classes, that don't have access to a bank, they don't have access to transactional history, so they can't apply for loans, they can never get out of the, the, the poorest state that they're in, because they don't have access to these financial services. Um, we start to see that changing where they, you can get financial services from, from environments closer to those consumers and they don't necessarily have to go to a bank. We're starting to see a peer-to-peer -peer lending environments coming, coming into play um, that give access to, to banking services to consumers that ordinarily couldn't, couldn't get access to that. From a Mauritius perspective, um, I think we, we're still in a very traditional state in Mauritius. Um, I think people are still too hung on and too traditional about cash. We move cash around quite, quite significantly in, in Mauritius. And you just have to see that at the merchant perspective. And merchant drive a lot of the merchants drive and retail drive a lot of these adoptions in terms of, you know, you, you see a lot of merchants and, and environments in, in Mauritius don't take credit card, they don't take, you know, that all they want is cash for whatever reason. Um, but I think we need to step away from that. We need to work, move into a more digital processing in terms of transactional flow where this information is actually tracked. Uh, consumers would get a better credit rating because you, uh, those, those financial exchanges are recorded um, from a banking account perspective. And if you look at COVID, I would hate to think, um, what the impact of cash had on COVID and the spreading of COVID in terms of um, touching money, everyday money exchanging, um, where you know infected people are, are infecting notes, which notes go to other people. So you know, moving away from a cash environment, I think is, is high on, 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 on many agendas. Um, I think that there's going to be some challenges in terms of the adoption rate um, as far as Mauritius is concerned and offering these environments. I think in Mauritius context, the banks in particular need to get closer to the customer. It's still very difficult to open a bank account in Mauritius in terms of the regulation, um, the KYC requirements. You can't do it online. You have to go to the bank in terms of the branch, take a stack of papers. Um, you know, in most in other developed countries, this can be done online. You can do your KYC online. 
all that all that secured by very um, secure protocols in the back end from a KYC perspective in terms of making sure and doing the right referential checks in terms of you are the person that you are when you create when you register that account. So I think from a Mauritius context, banks should become a little bit more open. They should get closer to their customer from a digital perspective um, and make that experience a, 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 a better experience than they have now. You know, I hear of, of, of cases in, 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 from a banking perspective that it takes six months to open a business account. You know, businesses can't operate in today's world waiting for a bank account. For, if I've got a great idea, I want to market it, I want to put it on my, on my webpage, I want to create, it, and create a digital environment to interact with my consumers, but I can only get a, a, a bank account in six months. We're not enabling SMEs by, by, by having that sort of process. So we have to streamline them, make them a, a lot less friction, um, to make them frictionless, um, to to enable these services that consumers can actually can actually take and and, and, and be prosperous with. So, so I think banks have got a lot to do in in, in, in Mauritius in terms of enabling those. Um, a lot of it is we quite quite um, it's quite onerous in terms of the regulation. Um, we can't do this without the regulators. The regulators need to come to the party. You know, we've got regulations in, in most countries that are written in the 1940s that aren't really um, conducive to today's uh, in today's in modern days transactional terms and how consumers are transacting with financial services. So this needs to change. Business needs to get closer with the, uh, with, with the regulators and we need to come up with a solution that enables environments to give people the opportunity to, the, to, to access these financial services um, for, for the better good of Mauritius and the community um, and for the better good of Africa. You know, if you look at Africa, um, I think, I think, at the moment, just, just look at remittance. How, how expensive is remittance? Um, if you want to send money around the world with all the exchange controls, luckily Mauritius doesn't have exchange controls as, as, as other countries, but it's still very expensive to send money home. Um, um, you know, especially we, we have a, quite a large uh, population in terms of, of immigrants that are working, that send money home. It's very expensive. It's up to seven to 9%. Um, I think we need to come together in terms of how do we reduce that. I think Mauritius belongs to the the, the UN in terms of uh, reducing those costs by two, by 2023. There's the um, the the um, MOCAS, the, the the payment switch. I think needs needs to be needs to be you know, looked at in terms of how is that being adopted. How what's the fee structure there so so we can bring bring the community closer and make it more affordable to move money. Um, and, and foster, obviously. Um, so I think, for, from a from a from a cyber security, you know, I, I think they go hand in hand. You can't do the one without the other. So we need to still make sure that the pace that we move in, that we have the underlying thing in terms of, you know, how do we secure these transactions? How do we secure people's information? How do we secure the interaction between application and consumer? Uh, this is where. Um, the, the cyber security elements come into place. You know, you're only going to transact as a consumer with environments that are PCR compliant, that aren't storing your credit. So these sort of certifications and, and, and processes are important and they need to be exposed to, cons to consumers so that they know that we, we're in a protected environment um, if, we transaction, if we're transacting digitally. Okay. Thank you. I think it's exciting. I think it's, I think it's a huge opportunity for Mauritius. Um, yes. Because I think this wave of, of digital of the digital space is going to create jobs. Um, it's going to increase our skills base, um, the talent. Will, you know, and I think we really have a lot of good skills in Mauritius that that are that are. You know, but, I, but I also think that COVID is is you know the funding for fintech has definitely slowed down due to COVID. Um, people aren't on funding at the rate that they used to. Um, so I think this this is. All this is one of the challenges that we might face in terms of the growth. Okay. Thank you, Edgy. Uh, that was a wonderful response. I think the viewers have got a uh, gestalt of fintech and cybersecurity by now. So let me move on to the next round. That's for all the three participants. Uh, kindly unmute all the three participants. Your question goes here. The Mauritius ICT Authority recently announced a public consultation on proposed 
amendments to the ICT Act, which would allow monitoring and regulation of public social media accounts. This proposal has led to a lot of public debate. What are your thoughts and perspectives on the changes proposed, especially from a security perspective? Uh, the floor is open for all participants. So probably let, let me start. Um, okay, sure. I think I think I'm I'm really glad that um, the ICT authority has has actually gone for public consultation, giving everyone the opportunity and the possibility to actually comment, um, because definitely that would impact our data privacy, and that's a very important uh, thing to protect. Um, but at the same time, I do understand that there's an issue in terms of the 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 level of misinformation and fake news that we are experiencing uh, in in the country. Um, the, the issue is that all those platforms actually work on an algorithm that would push an information which people look at more. And there's this human psychology that you tend to look at a information which is bad rather than positive more. And if you spend a lot of time on Facebook, you realize that it's very negative and all the comments are very negative because that's where people spend most of the time reading and that. And that perception is a bit of an issue. I think that, that's to do with, with all social platforms. And this, this, is, this is a bit of a problem. I think um, there's, some, there's an issue there, but how you control it um, is, is, the, uh, is my concern. Because first of all, uh, the way they're saying, the tool set that they, they, they said they're going to apply, I, I feel that this can easily be bypassed by just using a VPN. Um, if I use a VPN, I'm just going to be logging from the UK and, and do whatever I want. I think, I think that's, that's easy. And oh, I use a, tab, uh, a Tor browser as well. I mean, this, is, this is, uh, goes through several layers as well. So, I mean, it, it, it's not that the, the solution is not going to solve the problem, I think, to, to, to my, my perspective. Um, and also, um, I think when, when they talk about, I mean, I'm going to take the, the operational aspect as well. When we talk about the National Digital Ethics Committee, um, and they say they are going to decide um, um, whether it's right or wrong or, and, and actions to be taken, then we will need that committee to be available 24 seven and seven over seven. Because if the issue is about national security and the fake news going around and causing havoc, you need people to respond very quickly. Not that because it's sent on a Friday and on Monday that you're going to respond. So that, that is very important uh, at the same time. Um, so on, on, from my perspective, I agree there's a problem. Um, I don't think the how they're going to solve it is, 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 is going to work personally, maybe for the mass, maybe, but it's very soon that people will know how to get a free VPN. And I mean, that, that's going to be very easy to use. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an alternative proposal as well. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a hard problem to solve. So maybe my, my other colleagues there may, may, may share any insights that they have. Yeah, um, so I agree with Krishna where in terms of, uh, in terms of the how it's really difficult. Uh, so one, one thing that um, is really important, especially for us Mauritians, is uh, uh, our freedom of expression. So it, uh, whatever controls the government is going to put, uh, if they're going to put also, uh, it should really be really transparent and uh, open to, uh, to us, the public, and uh, they should be uh, willing uh, to, to accept criticism because those types of systems always gather lots of criticisms and uh, especially uh, so some people may feel that, uh, as Krishna mentioned, uh, um, it's always subject to an algorithm which will push uh, a certain bias towards uh, certain types of uh, certain types of articles. Uh, from another aspect that uh, we have to consider as well is uh, how, how the government is going to implement the infrastructure to do so. So Krishna touched on the, the VPN, um, Tor and other su su uh, subjects, but assuming that most of the people won't be using those types of information, how, how is the government going to monitor all these? Uh, how are they going to protect all of the data? Because uh, they'll have to retain those information for analysis. They have to retain all, all of this, which is essentially having a backup copy of whatever is being uploaded and uh, posted. So that's another aspect of, uh, from my perspective, what should be considered as well.
Thanks, William. Um, I think my, my view, and it's it's really boils down to I think where the controversy would would would, would erupt is, is around the censorship. I think I think that's where everybody will gravitate immediately towards. Well, it's the freedom of speech. Um, I'm being censored, now I'm being watched, I can't speak my mind. And I think as an outsider of Mauritius, you know, I think the world's perspective of Mauritius is one of, it's it's a lovely place, it's a beautiful island, it's got beautiful people, people, you know, generally, you know, enjoy a very harmonic uh, or, or wars not breaking out as, as, as some of the other African countries. So I think from that perspective, um, it's going to be interesting to see how, how people react in terms of their freedom of speech and how, if that's been censored. Um, I also I also agree that you know, but you know, I, I can, you know, on, on one hand, I also get why why the state does want to implement some sort of protection because you know, as you know, TikTok is collecting lots of data about your children. Um, is that correct? We have children have access to 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 Facebook. Um, Facebook's a wasteland of, 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 of adverts and, and, and fake news, so to speak. Do we want them exposed to that? So, you know, I think there's an element topic um, because, you know, so not all social media is good for you. Um, how's my connection? I'm getting another message. So, so I also see some, of you know, I, I see the reasons why. Can you hear me, Shiba? Yeah, I think it's breaking. Um, your, your voice is breaking. Okay, better now? Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. You okay. can continue. But for me, I think the big question is, is, is the how, you know, um, how, how do we do that via proxy server? Yeah, so everybody's going to get a cert, you know, what does a cert do on your device? Only look at your social media, you know, because once you accept that through, the, they'll push that through the ISP, you accept the cert, what does that mean? What do they only have access to my social media? Um, how does that data that my comments or my exchanges, which are public anyway, um, you know, what are they stored? What do they do with that data? Do, do I get prejudiced by, by that data? So I think this is where the questions will, 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 will start to arise in terms of, okay, now you have my data, what are you doing with it? Um, how, do I, how do I trust that you're doing the right thing with my data? So I think that's be will be quite interesting. Uh, you know, I think I think people does this extend to other other things like Messenger, uh, WhatsApp? I believe not because that's a that's a private and a public key exchange between the end. There's end to end encryption there, so I don't think it's going to include that, and it would be impossible unless they have a master key from WhatsApp or, or, or Facebook Messenger, which I believe not. Um, so I think I think the how is still needs to be explored, and I, and I, and I commend um, the the approach in terms of let's go to public um, views, public interest. Let's keep let's see how the I think that's a great idea. Um, so I think I think things will involve um, sort of unfold, and some of the unanswered questions might get answered. Um, but I think it's just a thought at this stage, and I, you know I, I still I'm still fascinated to to understand how they're going to do this successfully. Because no country is doing it successfully to date, except for China, but they just block everything. That's true. <laughs> I think one, one, one last point uh, to this is, you know, those social platforms are all free. They are running a business. So you have to ask yourself, whenever you're using a, a free platform, how do they make their money? Don't use a, a free platform for confidential information. I think we shouldn't, you use Gmail, you use all these are free. I mean, you are the, the product at the end of the day. They are using your data. When Facebook have shown it with Cambridge Analytica, which they're, they're profiling people based on what you do on Facebook. So if you really want to secure your data, don't use social platforms. I mean, whatever you put on social platforms should be ultimately yeah. public information. I think that education should, should be given to, to people as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a very that's a very valid point, Krishna. Because you know, if if you think you think I don't think consumers actually understand what what you're signing up for in terms of these. They, they, they're actually putting a they're putting a tracking element into as a pixel into into your into your browser into your application, and it's basically tracking everything you do on your on your phone. And you've given them permission to do that, uh, which is 
And that's how the, 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 the advertisers know where you are. Have you ever wondered when you're searching for something on, on Facebook and all of a sudden you open your browser and, and, and adverts start popping up? Because there's something on your phone, especially an iPhone, it's called an IDFA. So it's a, it's a, it's a tracking mechanism built for, for advertisers to track you. So the, the whole environment, and if you look at, you know, when, when you say about um, Facebook, you know, they just reported you know, $28 billion two days ago when they, when they released their financials for Q1, because that's all advertising revenue. So, you know, it's, it's really just about adverts and pushing those adverts and learning your behaviors so they can better understand you. And they're tracking everything you do. Now, luckily, um, which I think this is where phone manufacturers might play a role um, in, 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 in not allowing this to take place in, in the phone, because if you look at your iOS 14.5 release, I think it came out a few days ago, that actually your IDFA is now being restricted. They've got a transparency um, um, uh, toggle. So you can actually go turn off the toggle at the phone level um, to switch off the actual tracking. Facebook's obviously not very happy about this. So there's a bit of a war going on with, with Apple and Facebook because Apple believes that uh, internet should be for the right things and not for advertising. Um, and, and obviously Facebook have a different view. Um, so, so, so I think that's a great feature from a, from a phone manufacturer that's actually giving the power back to the individual to say, well, I want to protect myself and I don't want to be tracked and I don't want my data to, um, or uh, Facebook to abuse my data. Uh, that's not possibly of my interest. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a great observation there, Krishna. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you all, uh, Eddie, Krishna, and William. Uh, it was indeed a great, um, how do you say, fruitful discussion. And I think the audience have got a good message on the importance of the data protection, mainly, and uh, also on the security aspects of using this free uh, anything that is free, whether it's a, it's a social media or a Gmail or whatever, like Krishna has mentioned, I think we, we, we need to think well before we give our personal data on the net. So it's a kind of maintaining a cyber hygiene mainly. So I move on yeah, to the I'll next. Yes, okay. yes, Eddie. Yeah, I think you know, if any consumer or any person is, is, is downloading an application, I think the first thing you need to go is to the settings menu and understand what settings they provide there because that'll probably give you a good view in terms of what they're doing because they are obliged by the, app, the Apple store or the, or, the, or the Google Play store when they actually submit their application to provide certain switches in those privacy. So go check because by default, they're usually turned on. So I would encourage all users yeah, yes. to encourage any other user to check, go straight, as soon as you finish downloading, go straight to the settings menu and understand what settings they are. Um, that's true. I think that's really important. Yeah, so just, just now uh, we are running out of time. So now I move on to the question and answer session. We have questions from audience. So I take up a question for uh, Krishna. Uh, I have a question. Is there any framework from local regulator on cybersecurity for FS industry? Um, as, as William mentioned before, the banking sector, uh, so the Bank of Mauritius, has got a number of guidelines. Um, and there's, there's one that's still missing, actually. There's one on IT risk management that has never been released. And it was a very comprehensive one. Uh, but still, there are some supporting guidelines around it, which, is, which, which does help uh, for specific uh, items, internet banking, etc. Uh, in terms of the wider financial services, so the FSC has issued uh, a circular a couple of years ago, and it, it is it is very to the point. Eh? I mean, I, I, I for the basics, it, it gets it very very uh, to the point basically. Yeah? So you have it asks for IT policies and, and procedures. You have to do a cyber security risk assessment. You have to do an IT audit. You have to do pen test. You have to have arrangements for contingency planning. So if it happens to you, what you have to do. And lastly, you have to do cyber awareness training. So I think it's there. Um, and a lot of management companies have been, have been addressing uh, these points uh, because there has been a lot of pressure recently. Uh, but it, it, is, it is there. But 
I mean, it can go further in terms of the wider, so insurance companies and things like that. I think mean, this, this part is, is still, uh, still missing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, I take up the next question that's for Reddy. Uh, there's a question here. Do you think the consumers in Mauritius are ready to adopt or use fintech services? Mtel Cash, Mighty Money, et cetera. They are not widely adopted by consumers in Mauritius. Eddie, the floor is yours. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question um, because adoption, it's, it's all about adoption. Um, I, I'm still a strong believer as people don't know what they want until you give it to them. So you've got to give it to them in a way um, when, you, when you're looking at that adoption strategy, I think some of the mechanics are already there. I don't think that is as mature as, as we'd like them to be if you look at these applications from, from Mtel and Mark. You know, MCB is not bank agnostic. It's only really a payment thing. So it's not, it's not, there's no wow factor from a, from a juice perspective. Uh, so consumers will adopt it. They find it convenient. But, they, you know, I think, you know, with, with Marty, really, it's just, you know, you got to fund cash and then use that cash in your account. It's quite cumbersome. So I don't think it really solves what consumers are looking for in terms of a, a payment method with value-added services. So, for example, I think these would be, more, there'd be, you know, all users and merchants, when they adopt product, they always, you know, it's an old question, what's in it for me? Um, what will I get out of this? It's just another way of paying. I can use my credit card, so I can use cash. As soon as we start applying value-added services on those um, applications like loyalty, um, voucher systems for merchants to attract new customers, I think we'll start seeing adoption accelerating because it brings value to the consumer and the merchants. And remember, in these payment methods, merchants drive a lot of the adoption by offering those services that are convenient and value added for the consumer. So I think until we, we start seeing applications that provide more value um, other than just, it's just a convenient way of paying, I, I think the adoption will be slow. Okay, thank you, Eddie. So I have another question. Uh, I think it could be answered by Eddie or Krishna. How do you assess Mauritius fintech landscape relative to the other East African countries? Um, I think we used to say that Mauritius is the tiger of the Indian Ocean, right? Um, today, I think we're on the trend of becoming the cat of the Indian Ocean. Um, what I've seen in Kenya, um, the the advanced, um, I mean, there, there are, I mean, MPSA, I mean, if you've heard about it, uh, mobile payment system, SMS based, um, it's it's surprising how they've, they've created so many technologies that are very tailored to their market. Um, and things like Uber Eats already exist over there. Um, there's lots of, of applications that already have, have, have like mushrooms have been, have been growing over there. Um, I think I think we we are lagging behind big time, and and it's probably large part, maybe due to our education system, maybe because we we tend to be very um, academic from from the from from the base and not practical. And the African countries they they've been learning a lot. YouTube, Google, practical, and they get solutions. And I think that's where the edge is coming from. Yeah, that's true. Thank you, Krishna. I have another question that's on cybersecurity. Maybe uh, William or Krishna can answer that for me, for uh, the, the audience. We are developing a crypto payment gateway and uh, we intend storing users' private key in the cloud in case if their phone got missing. So what will be the implication in terms of cybersecurity? William, would you like to answer? Sure. So. As with anything storing on the uh, any data on the cloud, uh, you just have to be careful in terms of uh, access, even in terms of uh, the contract. So, uh, what sort of contract you have with the cloud service? So, so, some cloud service provider actually mentions that they they have a right to see what you have uh, in the storage. So that would be typically a no no. Um, others uh, would actually be uh, so similarly what we saw with uh, the Spectre. Uh, spectre vulnerability, where um, sometimes on uh, on the cloud you have uh, several servers and several applications on the same server. 
So we have to keep that in mind, especially when we're talking about uh, uh, encryption keys uh, and other things as well. So really, uh, um, my my uh, my uh, my recommendation or my advice would be always treat uh, the cloud as something that you don't control, and uh, see how how you uh, you can mitigate the risks uh, from that point. Okay, thank you, William. And, and you I'm also have to consider the local legislation as well. I mean, for example, in Mauritius, the C authority is guided by C directives. And there's a number of best practices that are, are written in there. So what you'll be allowed and not allowed to do will also depend on your local legislation. That's true. I have a question. Uh, that's my, uh, I will take the last question. That's for uh, Eddie. When talking about fintech and cybersecurity, what do you think about the adoption of crypto exchange to transform the institutional investment landscape in Mauritius? Uh, continued by one more uh, question. How far is it realistic enough to consider in our country? Yes. Yes, Eddie. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a very, yeah, it's, it's a, very mature question in terms of where we are now, you know, in terms of the grayscale investment, Tesla investment, talk about, you know, there's, there's over 40,000 RP listed companies in the world, so listed companies that are trading on the stock exchange, and already 32 have cryptocurrency in the name of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. We saw that the other day with Tesla buying 1.8 billion worth of, of, um, of, of Bitcoin. Um, and then selling it about two days ago, they sold about 300 million of their Bitcoin at, 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 at huge profits. So we, can, we see the value of institutions getting involved in cryptocurrency because of its um, demand and supply nature in terms of economics. But going back to the question, you know, is it, is it fit for, 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 for Mauritius? I, I don't see why not. In terms of my understanding of the FSE is that you can't tender a cryptocurrency or a digital asset for like a fiat through a bank or anything. So you can't take, you can't go and buy the cryptocurrency and then exchange it for, for cash in, in Mauritius. That's, that, that's not allowed. But my understanding is also that you can purchase a digital asset, but it's a, basically at your own risk. Um, I'm open to correction there. Um, so I, I don't see why institutions that feel that their analog cash-based system that's sitting in reserves, if, everybody got, if anybody's got cash reserves, basically these are discounted in terms of value anyway, um, you know, why, why they wouldn't consider uh, purchasing uh, cryptocurrencies as a store of value um, now. You know, I don't think, I don't, I don't think they, they're not allowed to do that. They can do that. Um, you know, whether Mauritius is ready for it is, 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 is an open question. Um, I, I don't see why not in terms of its, uh, its value that we see in the marketplace at the moment. Um, a crypto exchange, I think that's a different, uh, a, a, quite a, you know, how, you know, would you get a crypto exchange license in Mauritius? Probably not. Um, so I think that this is mostly regulated by Mauritius in terms of how will people buy or exchange cryptocurrencies? But as you know, there's 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 a lot of exchanges such as Binance, Bittrex, Poloniex. There's so many um, that you could Coinbase that listed a couple of days ago. We saw Coinbase exchange list on on, on, on the Nasdaq, um, which was very interesting. So this was a first as well. So there's many places that you can actually purchase these on exchange perspective. The only thing I, <laughs> that if you do that, you know, obviously there's the storage of the private keys that's very important. Don't leave it on the exchange. So I think um, going back to the question, um, okay. is Mauritius, I don't see why not. I don't, I don't see why not um, if com companies are prepared to do that. The only thing is if they want to sell it, they can't bring it back into, into Mauritian ripping. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie, William, and uh, Krishna. And thank you, viewers, for attending today's webinar on securing fintech's future opportunities and challenges in fintech and cybersecurity. On behalf of Mauritius Africa Fintech Hub, I thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.